Dr. Naomi Murphy, how are you doing? You okay? Hello, I'm good, thank you. Yes, thanks for inviting me on. Very welcome. It's entirely our pleasure. Uh, maybe you can just let our uh, listeners and viewers uh, know about yourself. How would you describe what keeps you busy? Yeah, so I'm primarily a clinical and forensic psychologist, um, but I also host the podcast Locked Up Living, um, where there might be some some similarity of overlap at times in terms of issues we've covered. And I'm also founder of Octopus Psychology, and we are the UK stockist of Rushy Wave bilateral um, light stimulation glasses, which help calm the nervous system. Well, it's a lot going on there, so I've got mm. plenty to work with. Uh, tell me about Locked Up Living. What's the main focus of this? Well, myself and my co-host both worked in prisons for very many years and we were interested to have conversations which promote more more positive attitudes towards, um, we, we explore things that are difficult to cope with in quite toxic, challenging environments and find ways to try and overcome them. So a lot of our guests have been people who've been in or worked in or around or been in and around the criminal justice system, but we've also touched on elite boarding schools, the police, compassion in the NHS, um, the challenges of elite sport. Wow. So you're not not consigning yourself just one thing here. There's lots going on. This is great. So you would have been keeping a keen uh, interest in the Lucy Letby case that's been playing out across the, the UK and further afield, obviously, these last few weeks. There's horrible, tragic details in that. And a lot of people are asking the, you know, the, the million pound question, why, why would she do this? I mean, what can we what can we understand about the, the potential motivations of somebody carrying out an act this this evil? Yeah, well, obviously, I don't know Lucy Letby, but in terms of why health professionals have committed similar kinds of offences, you know, we've had people who, um, you know, somebody who hated elderly patients, who targeted elderly patients, we had obviously Dr Shipman, um, mm -hmm. believing he was putting people out of their mercy at the end of the end of their life. Um, but I think two two possible factors are there in this case, where, um, you know, I think we associate um, nurses with being angelic, um, you know, saviors, heroes. And I think there seems to be something in that picture um, around Lucy Letby, you know, be the most supportive, the most caring, the most educated nurse. And I also wonder whether there's something about the relationship with the family. There's a lot of, you know, over 2,000 searches for family members of the of the babies online, including sort of searching on Facebook on Christmas Day, um, keeping photos of cards that she'd sent to the family. So I do wonder whether there is a motive to, you know, envy of the family unit or an attempt to attack the, the family unit in some way. But we can't know that and we won't know, you know, unless she collaborates and writes a book with somebody, we're unlikely to ever really know. But my experience of working with people who kill generally is even when the offences don't seem to make any sense, they don't, they look really bizarre, there is always some kind of, uh, rationale or logic even if it's quite a warped logic in the mind of the person who's carried out, out those acts has doing what you do in any way in the nicest you know in, in a sort of a pre preferential way made you approach this subject in a sort of dispassionate way that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise because uh, as the people you know general public who haven't got an experience with these kind of people would be getting incredibly frustrated you know wanting to know why you know this this question and for someone like you who has your experience you'll be well aware that that question even the question often doesn't make sense in these scenarios so are you able to sort of view it from that dispassionate sort of attitude now well you know i have spent over two decades working with people who've committed very serious violent and sexually violent offenses and i have to say i've never ever met somebody who didn't have the most awful childhood themselves mm. so you know multiple experiences of abuse and neglect absolutely commonplace in the history of people who commit serious offences I know people don't like to hear that and, and obviously that isn't an excuse and the vast majority of people who experience traumatic childhoods don't go on to commit um, acts of abusing other people but you can't you know it's, it's hard to get beyond the fact that those who are in prisons and secure hospitals have pretty much that's the norm in terms of their histories and my experience is the more brutal and callous the crime usually the more brutality the person has had to cope with themselves during childhood so they learn to dissociate disconnect don't connect to their feelings kind of switch off to the humanity of other people at times um, because they don't have the capacity to process their emotions effectively.
That's a great answer. So uh, just a suggestion for anyone who has any questions for Dr. Naomi Murphy, if you put them in the comments, we will we'll pick through the best ones, of course, and, and see what she has to say. Uh, so I, I'm a, I'm very much aware of this this trope, mostly from movies, I have to say, which is the extent extent of my research. But there's always this suggestion that, you know, child murderers are not well liked within the prison population. And it's, it's going to be a very dangerous environment for her. And I suppose a lot of the general public relish in that kind of attitude this idea that she will come to some harm because of what she's done uh what can you say about the prison system where maybe that does where there, maybe there is some truth in that suggestion yeah it was definitely a hierarchy of offenses in prison with people who offend against children really being at the bottom of that pile and if you think in prison you've got lots of people who are full of shame have um they're treated by treated in a you know they're treated they're shamed by society for the actions the shameful actions they've committed so people are generally try and find other people to look down on to feel better about themselves and to enhance their their own self-esteem so that that definitely goes on and people who commit crimes against children are definitely um likely to be a target um by other prisoners on occasion because there is a lot of hatred and bearing in mind what I've said about people having experienced abuse and neglect themselves, people in prison have got these kind of traumatic histories. So they're very easily inflamed by the idea of somebody who wants to harm children because they've, they've experienced that themselves quite often. Um, so that's, that's definitely there. But on when she first goes to prison, she's likely to be housed alongside other prisoners who have committed, who've also committed offences against children um, and she will be classed probably as a in prison they use the term vulnerable prisoner and what that means is vulnerable to attack from others but I have to say it's not a phrase that I personally am very comfortable with because it you know actually you know if you were to ask the parents of um, her victims whether um, Lucy Letby is a vulnerable individual they'd obviously know she'd say no she's a very dangerous individual so I think when we slap the label of vulnerable on people it kind of allows them to retreat in into victimization in a way and not and to take a step back from responsibility and then I think the other factor to be considering of course is at this moment in time you know as I understand it she was protesting her innocence right till till the end well I've you know seen plenty of um comments online about you know this is a miscarriage of justice um she, she's innocent um so actually if Lucy let me stink sticks to that line in prison um then actually there may be enough people that that support her because they think that um that she's a, a victim of you know miscarriage of justice it always blows my mind that kind of thing where it doesn't matter what sort of crime you're in there for you'll always find people that will support you. I think Charles Manson's a very famous case of this for sure. I suppose as well, with her being so utterly high profile in the things she's done, is it possible she will get fair and just treatment within the prison system now? And I mean, not I'm not just talking, you know, fellow inmates or you know, staff there as well, having to deal with her, knowing knowing what she's done. I mean, how it's difficult to to talk about this with like like you say to sound like you're somehow defending her, but uh, it just feels like she doesn't seem to have much chance of having uh, the system work the way it's designed to work because she's so high profile. Yeah, I think I think that's a really tough one because she's so notorious. You know, it's like everybody, everybody in prison, every you know, everybody in the whole country knows who Lucy Letby is. I think that will also, to some degree, attra attract a degree of voyeuristic individuals. You know, there will be people who will, what who will be desperate to work with her in order to be able to say, oh, you know, because every, it will it will be a titillated point. I have to say, the vast majority of staff that work in prison are really professional and carry themselves conduct themselves in a very uh, professional compassionate firm but fair way but there will be people who are quite titillated by it there will also be people who are so disgusted by it that it'll be really hard for them to to hide their feelings and so of course actually in any um any kind of proceedings um then there is the risk that 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 bias comes into it you know i've 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 sat in uh, reviews of other prisoners where people have been so disgusted by their offences that they haven't actually been able to think about the um, the risk assessment, which is done in an objective way, because all they can all they can think about is the how disgusted they are by the actual offences, and they can't get beyond that um, in how they treat people. But 
for Lucy Letby, of course, can, in some ways, because she's been given a whole life tariff, so she's not going to get out of prison. So actually, in some ways, there'll be much less concern about what happens for her because she won't have the same opportunities other people have to, for re rehabilitation or to progress through the system and, you know, in order to, to make a move back into society. Look, looking at the evidence yourself that was that was made public and the she was obviously convicted and found guilty of these crimes. However, we, we do place that with the fact that she does maintain her innocence to this day. And although it seems like a, a clear cut case just from the you know deduction and the logic of it all in terms of where she was, what happened at what times, now this this perfectly correlated, uh, there is still a, a question mark over the whole thing. And you know, if a lot of people will probably defend the fact that it's not as clean cut as perhaps we'd like for a crime of this magnitude. What was your take looking at, first of all, the, the evidence presented and obviously her behaviour in court? I think, you know, there is a problem if it's if the evidence is circumstantial, but I have to say the jury spent a long time deliberating and I think it's interesting that they didn't convict her of all the charges that she faced, you know, so I do have faith in the jury process, but that's not to say there are never miscarriages of justice, you know, the very time you, there was one just two weeks previously, wasn't there, the man who was released from prison after serving 16 years for, for a rape he didn't commit. Yeah. Um, so that, you know, so that's not to say miscarriages of justice don't happen, but, you know, there, there are elements of the case, which, you know, I've obviously only had the same access to anyone else in terms of uh, what's been available in the media, but the fact that she had items at home like handover sheets for instance well those things that is not acceptable to take them home anyway that's the sign of a nurse that's not doing the job properly so actually if she'd had if she if she'd been arrested you know if she'd been found to have all these items at home in the first place there would have been concerns raised about that she'd probably been reprimanded for having those bits of information at home the preoccupation you know looking at for the families on facebook that's not normal behavior um for uh, a healthcare professional. Um, I think wanting to work in neonatal care because it's exciting, I find that a really unusual choice of word. I wouldn't associate neonatal care with excitement. I think staff that are seeking excitement go, in, go into forensic work or A&E, um, but they don't go into work where they're potentially going to be caring for sick children that could die because most people would recognise that's really painful, really traumatic. So it's not excitement that you're going to get from from that job ordinarily that's a great point and um i mean what explains them i mean if we just uh, i mean i i'm 99.9 percent .9 certain that she's responsible for this obviously uh but what and then with uh, just to start from that assumption what would explain her protesting her innocence this late in the day given all the evidence that's been presented given the fact now that she's she'll never come out of prison bar some kind of successful appeal which seems unlikely as well why would she maintain this air of innocence that's that's not that unusual to be honest no. with you no it's not um and you know actually i think that's why when people do um plead guilty there is some um acknowledgement of that in the sentencing ordinarily now i don't think even if lucy let had pleaded guilty I, I doubt that i doubt there would have been um a difference in the sentence um but you know i've worked with people who've spent 10 or 20 years in prison protesting their innocence waiting for family members to die because they haven't wanted to uh, expose their they haven't wanted to be such a disappointment to their parents or family members or uh partners they've they've held on to their innocence um claiming it's been a miscarriage of justice uh for very many years even though that's prevented them from moving on in the prison, you know, some of the people I've worked with, I think probably would have been out in the time that they'd spent in prison, stuck, just proclaiming their innocence during that time. So forgive my complete naivety on this question, um, but normally, well, normally, as if this is a normal thing, but I suppose when you were to send us a serial killer as she is to jail, the, the 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 feeling or the assumption would be that this person would be a danger to the rest of the the inmates to some extent and i'm sure there'd have to be some sort of risk assessment carried out there with the type of crime she's convicted convicted on sort of really helpless vulnerable children does that logically follow that she'd perhaps be a danger to adult inmates as well is this a stupid question 
Is, no, I don't think it, I don't think it's a stupid question at all. I think it's a good question. Um, but I think you're right. She, her normal, you know, her choice of victim is somebody who's a small child, uh, very very vulnerable. So I think she's unlikely to pose a risk to the people around her. You know, I haven't seen anything in the in the media that would suggest otherwise. So she's so she's not likely to pose that kind of kind of challenge. And I, that's one of the dilemmas that the prison service face at times is like how you I mean for her there won't be a, a need to address that risk because she's not getting out of prison but you know when you when we used to have prisons where we didn't have any female staff you know you could have prisoners in there that had committed um rape and murder of, of women but they're in a sterile environment if they're only ever having to deal with men and you know the prison service would find that quite difficult to expose some of their attitudes towards women if they're only if they were only having to interact with men. And you're not going to see Lucy Letby's risk to to others. I wouldn't have thought in in the time in prison. Oh, that makes sense. And uh, just to swing this to an even darker topic, I suppose. And whenever something like this happens, uh, especially in the UK, it reignites this debate about capital punishment. Uh, again, because on the face of people say, well, look, she's never going to be re rehabilitated. She's not going to see freedom in her life. This is just going to be, a, she's a young lady. She's going to be kept uh, behind bars the rest of her life at the uh, the taxpayer's expense. And it seems to, you know, yeah, I worry sometimes, I don't know how you feel on this, but I worry sometimes that the, the idea of bringing back capital punishment seems to be getting uh, more steam behind it. I just wondering, is this a debate you dip your head in and out knowing what you know? Which, is this something you feel like the country would benefit from? Oh, I really hate the, the fact that this subject comes up and I agree with you. It does seem to, it feels like it's got a bit stronger. I hope that people can see from that previous miscarriage of justice, um, you know, just the two weeks previously, that actually this does happen. Um, so even on that uh, one argument alone, I think that's an argument against the death penalty is that the, that there are these, these cases where um where the jury gets it wrong, um, but uh, but alongside that, I think you know from a more, more moral point of view, uh, we're taking issue with uh, somebody who has killed in cold blood. But actually, if we were to execute somebody for um, for committing serious crimes, isn't that also what we're doing? Um, you know, also you know committing an act in in cold blood, um, and. Uh, as I said earlier, people who commit these kind of offences, there is always that's the sign of a disturbed person. Somebody who's psychologically healthy does not um, commit that kind of kind of act. So, are we expecting other people to, you know, kill um, in the name of the state? And what toll would that take on the individuals carrying out that that job? Um, yeah. I, I disagree on it. And the other thing is, I don't think capital punishment isn't a deterrent. It doesn't stop no. people. people's crimes are driven by their emotions. So it doesn't it doesn't work as a deterrent. Um, so, you know, I disagree with it for all sorts of reasons. But if you want to take the most simple, it's that we could get it wrong. No, it's a great answer. And I agree with you. It's, it's a little too close to human sacrifice for my liking as well. I think uh, somebody's just asked a good question. I'm not sure if you 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 would know, uh, but going back to that kind of, we seem to be missing that smoking gun piece of evidence that would make this a bit more clear cut. Uh, Fanola's asked, is there no cameras in baby hospitals? Would that be unethical? I think they actually installed some surveillance cameras in, in there. Um, I could be wrong, but I think they actually did installed surveillance cameras but of course you wouldn't always be able to tell what was was happening and also you could be talking about you'd have to be suspicious that a crime had been committed and then go back and look over the footage because people wouldn't be wa watching footage all the time but I don't know whether they could have done more with surveillance. So I suppose the, the other aspect we've got of this really is, I mean, not just that she did what she did and was exposed for it. Uh, it seems to me that if somebody's going to decide to abuse their power in that manner, it doesn't seem like a whole lot you can do about it until after the fact, unfortunately. But we have this mixed in with the fact that the NHS seemed to do appallingly in, in exposing this or listening to the people who were trying to expose it kind of got caught up in this bureaucracy and this idea of trying to avoid negative PR. Um, I mean, I assume we're going to have a big inquiry about this, but what's your take on the fact that many people tried to blow the whistle on this, this heinous crime and were either ignored or in some cases reprimanded? Sadly, that is absolutely commonplace, not just in the NHS. It's, it happens in independent hospitals. It happens in all sectors, all industries. So I've run uh, workshops for 
people who've blown the whistle and also provide support. But my, my experience of, of all these people is that people speak up and they experience um, recrimination, retaliation, false allegations, even physical violence. You know, we published a podcast conversation today with Eileen Chubb, who was a whistleblower exposing elder abuse in, uh, you know, old people's um, care homes. And she faced physical violence at work. Well, 14% of people who speak up at work experience physical violence and 75% um, are frightened of experiencing that. It's That's the norm for people who speak up at work. And I think, you know, we, although we have laws around corporate manslaughter being a possible charge when something like this happens, we don't actually pursue that. So the laws to protect whistleblowers aren't working. Um, the regulatory bodies don't don't work effectively. We've seen hospitals like the Edenfield Centre in Manchester, um, Walton Hall up in the northeast, where you know the CQC go and do an inspection and say everything's fine, and then very shortly afterwards, you know, the TV channels are exposing horrific abuse in these places. So we don't make it safe to speak up, and uh, you know, a lot of people don't you know lack the courage to be able to do that anyway but even when they do have we've seen from how these doctors were treated in this case that you know they were treated as the bad guys and made to apologize um and threatened threatened with disciplinary action so that is unfortunately that is really really rife throughout the uk probably worldwide um but rife throughout the uk and not just within the nhs yeah that's that's very uh concerning to hear uh, especially from someone with your experience but i mean what's what explains that then because the people who were um, who were trying to dampen this down or not pursue it or completely nip it in the bud were not the people who were i suppose having the finger pointed at them it was lucy letby and it seemed like the the logical smart move even from a pr perspective would be to fully investigate any wrongdoing and get her you know, down the path of facing justice rather than almost helping her get away with it. Now, is this a, is this a case of a, a sort of protectionist attitude towards the NHS and just trying to protect it from any sort of negative uh, headlines, etc.? Or is it, are we talking just plain old incredulity and incompetence here from the, uh, the, the top brass? <laughs> I think probably a combination of all of those right. things. So I think there probably was an element of finding it impossible to believe that someone who looks very wholesome, a very attractive young woman, because she doesn't fit with the idea of what pe most people think of when they think of a, a murderer, you know, especially a murderer of babies, they think of, you know, somebody quite creepy and she that wasn't how she was. But I think we do have incompetence. We also have um, people running hospitals who are not healthcare professionals and also they're not regulated. So, you know, the well, the chief exec in that case, for instance, subsequently went to run another trust down on the south uh, southwest coast, didn't he? Um, so there's no consequences if you don't take action. And time after time, I've heard people make statements about protecting the reputation and the reputation being being what matters. And I think the introduction of market forces into the NHS was a, a massive problem here in terms of um, it lost sight of what the NHS is set up to do, which is to actually provide care for people and it, running it more like a business means you also import some of the attitudes to business. Now, you raise the point of it's just common sense, isn't it, to be to want to address problems, root them out and address them. And yes, you think so. But actually, you know, as I've said, it's kind of like rife across all sectors and all industries rather than... Um, you know, be able to take a hard look at the organisation and talk openly and candidly about, um, about you know, things that have happened, mistakes that have been made, people try and cover them up. And I think the culture of people are frightened of legal action. So they're frightened of holding their hands up and saying, yeah, we, we've screwed up here in some way because they're really fearful of legal consequences. And yet what we've seen time after time is if, organizations hold up their hands and say look i'm sorry i got this wrong that actually um that takes the anger there's a sense of people still might be really annoyed by what's happened really upset by what's happened but it stops people wanting vengeance stops people wanting to chase and chase and chase because people want to want the truth to out 
Yeah, that's a great answer. And I'm really quite disturbed at the idea. I mean, I was just speaking to the, the former guest about it. I mean, obviously, we'd agree that healthcare professionals, and you've obviously mentioned people in the prison service, you know, more or less overwhelmingly are, you know, good people who are there to do the right thing. Uh, however, there is something about certain professions that people looking to exploit it for, you know, nefarious reasons will be attracted to. And this seems to be the case with Lucy Letby. Well, I mean, it might be an assumption. And I'm just wondering if what could be done possibly to even prevent that. I mean, it seems to me it's hopeless. It seems to me that she, with all the sort of safeguarding in the world, it seems like she could have got away with what she did, perhaps not, not as long, but it seems like somebody wants to do that kind of thing or abuse their power in that way. Uh, they're going to be able to do it. Is, is there any way we can prevent the next Lucy Letby, do you think? I don't think we're ever going to be able to prevent that something from happening. But actually what we can do um, is, you know, if we were to start by being able to think the unthinkable, we would be able to nip something in the bud straight away. And, you know, I did some training with a colleague of mine, Des McVeigh, in a, in a psychiatric hospital. And uh, my colleague said, you know, how many people here think there's somebody here who's here to abuse the the client group, the children, it was uh, teenage, teenage um, clients. How many people think there's somebody here to abuse the clients and everyone's horrified and absolutely no way, no way. That, and my colleague got a phone call from the hospital director the next day saying, how could you raise this? This is awful that you've said this. But the, the whole point is if you're so adamant that nothing could happen, in your service you won't be able to see it when it does happen and you know you have to be open to the fact of the worst possible case scenario is always possible and you prevent that by being open to the fact that it could happen so that you see it when it does and then it's one baby not lots of babies that's a great point yeah nobody wants to have that uncomfortable moment of uh a kind of wondering if the people that you are close to are working with uh or even allow somebody else to question your own kind of motive no it's a very uncomfortable situation isn't it and there needs to be a better way to work through that i mean has the country lost a bit of faith in uh, the nhs now it's a story of this magnitude going to have a detrimental effect on people's trust when they're coming in especially i mean it must be the most anxious time in the world uh having a, a newborn and uh, people are going to start you know having questions now about trusting the hospital uh, absolutely. I mean, I, yeah, totally agree. It's going to be awful, isn't it, if you uh, go, uh, go into hospital to have a baby. Um, I think there has been a massive loss of trust in the NHS as a consequence of, of this. And I do fear that that will be used as a bit of a wooden horse of Troy um, to speed on privatisation of healthcare. But I have to say, I've seen similar incidents in private hospitals. So private hospitals don't do better. And I do think that the mindset of private organisations is just as likely to to make these kind of things happen but you know I think we need to see action against those who oversee who have responsibility for hospitals and actually if that were to happen you know if there was if there was one case of corporate manslaughter that would make um, trust boards terrified of not taking action when um, these kind of um, thoughts were being raised these questions were being raised because they'd be frightened of the consequences at the moment there's no fright there's no consequences if you don't do anything you know inaction is 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 basically the safest bet on a personal level um because that you you will face no no consequences well we've had a question i feel like you've comprehensively touched on this but maybe you might want to add to it angela thompson wants to know can i ask you what you think the way forward is <laughs> Good question. I think certainly I think that um, people on trust boards should be regulated. So if they're not a health professional themselves, I think they should there should be some sort of system for regulating them. Um, having said that, I don't think the regulatory bodies necessarily do a very a very great job. Um, I think there should be consequences for people who were passed information and then haven't acted on that information as I've just just said um and yeah i do think that people need to start thinking about what is the unthinkable um, and rewarding people who do speak up not financially but i mean you know in terms of actually people like eileen chubb who is who we'd interviewed this morning other whistleblowers we should be singing their praises um and celebrating people that have the courage to speak up not treating like them them like the pariahs and you know in many cases they're not able to work again because they're they're blackballed for um, being troublemakers. 
Well, Naomi, despite the incredibly dark uh, subject matter, I've actually really enjoyed uh, listening to what you've had to say and, and learning a lot from from what you know as well. So thank you very much for speaking to us. Maybe you can just point our audience towards where they can find your uh, some more of your content, some more of your work. Yeah, I'm very active on Twitter as an NM Psychologist. Our podcast is also on there, Locked Up Living. And I'm active on LinkedIn as well. Feel free to connect with me. Um, yeah, thanks very much. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for speaking to us. Thank you. Take care.